everyone and welcome to another video. Today I'd like to continue our discussion on partial differential equations. So in a previous video we looked at deriving the 1D wave equation claiming that it was one of the most popular partial differential equations around. Well if the 1D wave equation is the Mario equivalent of linear homogeneous partial differential equations then today I'd like to look at the Luigi of PDEs also known as the heat equation. So to set the stage for the heat equation, I uploaded a short video physically demonstrating heat transfer in a body while simultaneously managing to give myself a pretty good sized burn on my index finger. So if you haven't had a chance to watch this video, please take a moment to step back and view that and laugh at my expense a little bit before continuing on. So with an understanding of the physical phenomena we're trying to model, let's jump over to the whiteboard here and see how we can write the heat equation as a partial differential equation. All right, so with that being said, let's go ahead and see if we can derive the heat equation. Before we get into this, let's make a couple of simplifying assumptions. That's gonna make our life and uh, math a little bit easier. So first off, let's go ahead and assume that uh, basically we're dealing with a homogeneous material. Meaning that um, a lot of the physical properties of this material are constant, namely things like uh, sigma, which is gonna be referred to as the specific heat, um, of the material, this is in units of joules per kilogram Kelvin. This is constant here. Let's also assume here that the density, rho, is constant. Obviously, the density of this material is in, un is in units of kilograms per meter cubed here. And finally, let's assume that the thermal conductivity, let's call this K here, for thermal conductivity, is measured in units of joules per Kelvin second meter here. Okay, all of these things are going to be constant and uniform throughout the body. So again, this is a very good model for a homogeneous material, something like uh, pure aluminum or steel or that metal bar that we were playing with here. All obey this pretty regularly. Things like wood would probably not, things that are uh, uh, not homogeneous, that are anisotropic, uh, would probably not be modeled well using the approach here. But this is going to make our life easy. And, and again, this is all fairly reasonable for homogeneous materials at uh, non-extreme temperatures. Um, I don't really know what kind of mumbo jumbo happens near absolute zero or at ridiculous temperatures, but uh, in, in the ranges that we're talking about, this is probably reasonable here. So that's assumption one here. Um, assumption two, this is a big one here. So two here is let's assume that no heat is produced um, nor disappears inside the body. So no heat is produced nor disappears inside body. So if you remember here with our physical demonstration we talked about earlier, we, I, I was very careful to, to only start the experiment after we had imposed an initial condition on the temperature and then stopped adding heat, right? If you sit there shooting this thing with the blowtorch, you are definitely adding heat to the problem. And then the rest of the derivation that we're talking about today is going to go out the window. So what we want to assume for the rest of today here is that you have a situation where you just have a body and there's some temperature variations around the body and then you're just gonna snap your fingers and hit go and say, so let's see what happens here. And there's not gonna be any heat being produced by um, combustion or anything else like that here. Okay, so if that's, uh, that's true here, let's go ahead and look at our third assumption here. Um, experiments have shown, like the experiment we did with our metal bar here, that heat tends to flow in the direction of decreasing temperature. That's kind of a, a duh thing, right? But that rate of heat flow is actually proportional to the gradient of the temperature. So what that means is, right, if, if the velocity of heat flow is faster if you have these larger temperature gradients. So let's write that down here. So um, let's go ahead and assume that um, the velocity of heat flow 
Maybe let's go ahead and denote this as a vector here, V here, V bar here, right? This is going to be measured in units of joules per second, okay? That's the velocity of heat flow. And let's say that the velocity of the heat flow is uh, proportional to the gradient of temperature. So in other words, the velocity of heat flow here is going to be uh, negative of the thermal conductivity times the gradient of the temperature here. So the temperature distribution that we'd like to use here is, let's use our variable v, uh, u, excuse me here, for uh, temperature. So u here is really, this is the function that we're looking for. So u is going to be a function of x y z like where you are in the bar here or in the metal or, or the body that you're interested in and obviously it's going to be a function of time here right so this here is temperature temperature at point maybe we should say at spatial point x y z and time t right, our temporal point here, right? So here's our third assumption is that heat is going to behave like this. It's gonna flow in the opposite direction of the gradient. So it's gonna go from hot to cold here. So hence, hence the negative sign here, right? Okay, um, and maybe I guess we should tack units onto temperature here. So let's, let's stick with SI and use units of Kelvin here, okay? So here's some of the physical assumptions for our system. And with these in mind here, I guess we can kind of draw a picture of what we're talking about. So what we're dealing with here is we would like to have some body here um you know i don't know let's just draw it maybe it's, a, it's this perfect cube here or whatnot or rectangular object here so this might be the overall body okay and then what i'd like to do now is i want to consider some region in this body here maybe um, we'll draw it as kind of this and I'm trying to draw a volume, and I know it might not look like that here in in uh, in, in on the board. It's really hard to draw a three-dimensional object, but you can imagine this is a volume here inside this this larger body here. Okay, and let's denote this this region here as T here. So T is going to be the region of interest inside body. Okay. Furthermore, we are going to say that this re region T here, that volume, right, it's covered by a surface here, right? Let's call the surface S here. So S here is going to be the uh, surface of T. Okay. Okay. The last thing we want to maybe define here is that um, we are going to have a or, or define an outward facing normal for this here. So I have the surface S of T here. And from that surface, right, we can get a outward pointing normal vector at any point on this surface here. Maybe let's call that little n bar here, right? So little n bar here is going to be our outward pointing normal. Okay, uh, our point normal vector, I guess we can call it. All right. Okay, so if that's true, um, maybe let's, let's erase this and get a little bit more space. All right. The last thing that maybe might be helpful to visualize, maybe we'll do this in another color here, is right that heat is flowing through this according to this vector. Oh, I guess, shoot, I just erased it. But we have this vector field uh, V here. Whoa, that is the worst red pen I've seen in a while. Let's try this again here. Um, okay, so you've got this vector or of heat flow. I don't know which way it happens to be going here, right? It could be doing whatever, right? So you've got this vector field V, right? So if you look at this long enough, this should be ringing a lot of bells from our discussion of surface integrals where you see that I could start thinking about what, how much of the vector uh, field V crosses over the surface N. And we can measure that by kind of aligning how much of uh, a, a, the vector field at any given location, like right here, right? How is that aligned with the surface normal here, right? So what I'm basically getting at here is, let's write this down. You can think of this here as um, you have this quantity V dot N, right? Right? 
This is sort of telling you the dot product between these is, is telling you how much is the, vec the, the heat flow at a given location aligned with the surface here, right? And if we multiply that by the area here, right? And we take the magnitude of this thing, right? You can kind of think of this as this is really the amount of heat that's leaving T at a given area delta A, right? So this is heat leaving T at location, uh, you know, specified by delta A here, right? And again, we can remember that it's leaving because what we have is, is we specifically said that N, this unit vector, is an outward pointing uh, unit vector, right? So if this thing happens to be aligned with it here, um, yeah, you, we, we, we should be good here, right? Um, well, I guess maybe maybe we gotta be a little careful because I put the absolute value in here, so we sort of lost the, uh, the notation here. So maybe what we should say that this is the magnitude of heat leaving T at location delta A uh, if, right, if you have um, V dot N greater than zero. Right, that would mean that the the velocity or of the heat is roughly aligned with the outward point normal. So heat has to be leaving here, right? The other way you interpret this obviously is if uh, this could also be heat entering T at location delta A if V dot N is less than zero, right? So I guess, uh, yeah, this quantity, because I put the absolute value sign here, it's really telling you the magnitude of heat either entering or leaving. You can tell by the sign S-I-G-N of the dot product here which direction it's going, right? Okay, so what we should maybe do here is think about the total amount of heat flow across the entire surface S, right? So what we want to do is just basically integrate all over all of the delta A's around this surface here, right? So we can write up an expression here that says the total heat flow um, across S, across that surface, right? That's just basically taking V dot N, right? And now doing a surface integral or this flux integral over the surface S here, right? Okay, this is great here. Um, let's keep going. If you remember here, what did we say about the heat flow V, right? We said that, okay, experiments show that the heat flows in the direction of the negative gradient of the temperature distribution, right? We said, in fact, this was negative um, grad U, right? And again, remember, U is what we're sort of gunning for, right? Uh, maybe, maybe I should have, we should have talked about this earlier here, right? The overall idea here is I want to find, oops, sorry, goal, right? The goal of this here is find this temperature distribution U of X, Y, Z, and T, right? So I want to understand how is heat or temperature distributed over this entire uh, body here, okay? All right, so uh, here we go. We say that uh, the, the heat flow or the heat vector field is negative gradient of U here. So great, let's just substitute this in for uh, V, okay? So what do we end up with here? So this is basically integral. Oh, sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, I, I dropped a, um, where was K here, right? We needed to have the thermal conductivity in here. And I think we said, sorry, got too excited here. This is minus K grad. U, right, right, yeah, because we need the K to convert the units, right? Because this is in units of joules per second, this is in units of temperature, of Kelvin, so yeah, we need this this um, uh, thermal conductivity to uh, convert between here. Okay, so great, uh, what do we end up here? So I plug this in, this is minus K grad U dotted with N dA all over the surface, okay? Great, we said the thermal conductivity is constant over this entire thing, right? That was another one of our assumptions. So this can pop out of the integral. So we end up with, this is minus K, double integral of grad U dotted with N dA over the surface, right? Okay, great. Now, uh, let's go ahead and... If you remember, uh, this is basically, now this is a flux integral, right? So I've got this grad U is, is a vector, and I'm just going to integrate that vector over the entire surface S here. So this is basically a flux integral. And you know what? Um, the divergence theorem 
told us how to convert between a surface integral and a triple integral, right? So maybe let me erase this here. Erase our picture. And let's apply the divergence theorem here to convert between that uh, surface flux integral to a triple integral here. So let me just maybe quickly state here, if you recall the divergence theorem, it basically said what here? It said that you can take, uh, where did I have it here? Oh yeah, sorry, here. So the divergence theorem here, right, was you had some f dot n dA over some surface S here, right? That was the same thing as the triple integral of the divergence, whoops, div, divergence of that function uh, vector f over the entire volume here, the entire volume here, we called it T here, right? That was the region and it is enclosed by the surface S here, okay? So great, let's just apply this to our situation here and change that double integral into a surface integral here. So what we end up with here is um, we have negative thermal conductivity K here times triple integral of T times the divergence of the gradient of u, right, uh, over the entire volume t, so or dx, dy, dz, right? Okay, great. So if you look at this here, what is this? This is the divergence of the uh, gradient here. And actually, if you remember from our previous discussion that we actually showed that that was, um, oh crud, I, I forgot to scroll to it. Hold on a second. Let me, let me find that section here in the notes here because what I want to do here is we want to go ahead and show that basically the divergence of the gradient, that's the same thing as the Laplacian. So let me, um, let me pause the video here. I'm going to find the notes and we'll, we'll derive that real quick. All right, okay, I just wanted to make sure I didn't um, misquote anything here. So uh, let's go ahead and make a little side note here. And let's examine this integrand here. So uh, if you remember, right, so grad u here, right? This is just going to be partial u with respect to x, partial u with respect to y, and partial u with respect to z, right? That was the gradient here. So therefore, the divergence of the gradient here, right, is, well, let me tell, let me just write it over here. We get a little bit more space, and we'll write it down. So all I have to do is hit that with the divergence operator here. So in this case now, so the divergence of the gradient of u here, right? This now becomes, uh, sorry, where did I have it? Oh yeah, here, um, uh, d dx, right? Times the first element of this thing, which was over there, right? d u dx, right? Plus d dy, du dy plus d dz du dz, right? So this whole thing basically becomes partial u squared with respect to x squared plus partial u squared with respect to y squared plus partial u squared with respect to z squared here, right? And if you recall, this is the same thing as the uh, Laplacian uh, of u here, right? So this is the same as the Laplacian of u, right? So it's just another way to write this. So instead of having to write this combination of the um, double, uh, the second partials here, right? We just have a term for that. That's the Laplacian of u. So I can maybe um, more quickly write this this integrand down here as we end up with. Uh, let me switch back there here we end up with this whole thing looks like negative k triple integral over the volume or uh, over the region t of the Laplacian of u dx dy dz here, right? And remember the left hand side, this whole thing what we were trying to derive here was just an expression for the total heat flow across 
uh, the Surface S here, right? Okay, great. So let's box this up. We'll save this and we're going to use him in a second here, right? So here's one expression for the total heat flow um, across S. Okay, great. So now let's approach this from another perspective. Let's think about what is the total amount of heat that is actually in uh, the volume T. So let's come over here and see if we can get ourselves an expression here for the total heat in that region T here, right? And maybe let's call this H for the total amount of heat inside that region of interest, okay? So I think without too much um, uh, convincing here, I think you'll agree here that the way you could get that here is, let me just go ahead and take the, uh, the density of the, of, the, of the object here, right? Or of this material here, multiply it by the specific heat here, right? And if then I multiply by the temperature here and then integrate this entire thing over the entire volume, dx, dy, dz, right? This is basically telling you the total amount of heat here, right? So you got the temperature, you got the density, and you got the specific heat. Just to, recall, just to refresh everyone's memory here, right? Sigma here was the specific heat, right? This guy was units of joules per kilogram Kelvin here, right? Rho was the density, units of kilograms per meter cubed here, and U is the temperature, units of Kelvin here, right? So you jam all this thing together here. So what, what is the integrand here, right? So if you multiply all these things together, gosh, let me see, uh, joules per kilogram Kelvin, right? Times kilograms per meter cubed times Kelvin. So let's see what cancels out here. So it's this, 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 this here. So I get joules per meter cubed. So when I integrate this whole thing here, right, uh, this is now integrated by a volume that knocks out the meters cubed. So yeah, we end up with just units of joules here or total amount of heat. So yeah, units check out. This basically is now going to tell you if I perform this surface integral or sorry, the, the triple integral over the entire region of interest T, I get the amount of joules or amount of heat that's actually in that body, right? Okay. So uh, let, me, let me keep our boxed expression down there. If that's true, that's the total amount of heat here, what we can do now is let's think about asking what is the change in heat with respect to time here, right? And if H is the amount of heat this is actually measuring this, 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 this partial here is, is the amount of heat increase in T here, right? Well, actually, you know what I want to do here is let's put a negative sign in front of this here. So now what I can talk about is what this is actually measuring here, right? Isn't this the amount or, or the, the time rate of decrease of total heat? So this is time rate of decrease of heat in T. Right? Okay. So now what's so helpful about this is if you remember our other assumption, we said that we assumed that there was no heat being generated nor lost anywhere here. So if the heat here is being, uh, uh, is, is leaving here, let's go ahead and write down the, this expression here first. Um, all I gotta do is, is differentiate this thing here, right? So I gotta take the partial of this with respect to T. And if you look at this thing long enough, Let's ask, what of these things are changing with respect to time? So our earlier assumption said the specific heat is constant, right? It's just a single number because the material is not changing. So is the density. So these two things are not changing with time. The only thing that changes with time is, is the temperature here, right? So what I could do here is this entire thing can be rewritten here as, uh, what do we have? We have uh, sigma rho times volume integral T of basically U dx, dy, dz, right? Okay, now let's go ahead and, uh, well, here, let's, let's write this down. So this is time rate of decrease of heat in T. Great, and let's box this guy up, okay? Okay. So now uh, let's apply that assumption, like we said, that there's no heat being generated or lost. So 
the amount of heat that gets lost within T, the only way that this heat gets lost here, right, is that it has to flow across the surface S here, right? So in other words, these two have to be equal here, right? These have to be equal since no heat is generated nor loss in T within this region. Great. So if those two things have to be equal, let's just set these two things equal to one another here. Okay, so great. Uh, what do we end up with? Maybe let's, uh, yeah, yeah, I guess, yeah, let's do it over here. I don't want to run out of too much space here. Sorry, I didn't use the whiteboard as effectively as probably as I probably could have. All right, so let's write this here. We got sigma rho triple integral of t of u dx dy dz has got to equal um, sorry, crud, and I dropped a minus sign here. Sorry, sorry, there should have been a minus sign here. Again, got too excited and then I dropped, I dropped signs sometimes. Yep, yep, okay. Uh, all right, so, great, sorry, there should have been a minus sign here. Okay, this should equal here negative k times triple integral t of Laplacian of u dx dy dz. Great. Okay, so actually we can, uh, let's see, we can actually rearrange this a little bit here. So if you rearrange this, we could actually rewrite this whole thing as triple integral of t. I'm actually going to collect everything to one side here and we end up with, oh gosh, sorry. Ah. Sorry, sorry. Man, I'm, I'm, I'm really sloppy here. Sorry. This should have been partial u with respect to t, right? Yeah, sorry, because we took the derivative of the of the total amount of heat, and we said that the temperature was the only thing changing. So yeah, that's why this had to stay with inside the integral, and I had I could pull these two out. So gosh, sorry guys, um, that was sloppy. Okay. All right, now, sorry, now we're cooking here. So anyway, collect all of this together here, and we basically end up with partial u with respect to t, right? Um, minus k over sigma rho Laplacian of u. This whole thing is the integrand dx dy dz has to equal zero. Okay, great. So if we look at this now, what's really interesting about this is, you know what, we haven't actually specified a, re, a, a very specific region of interest T, right? We said this has to apply anywhere in the, in the volume here. So the only way this applies for any arbitrary T here, in order to make this equal to zero, that means that the integrand had better be equal to zero, right? So um, let's just write that down. In order for the above, to hold at arbitrary t, right? The integrand must be zero, right? So we end up here with, we're really darn close here. So this is basically, we end up with partial u with respect to t minus k sigma rho Laplacian of u has got to equal zero here. Right, and if you look at this long enough, this is basically some constant here. In fact, it's also a, it, it, it's a positive constant, right? So your thermal conductivity, your specific heat, your density, all of these are positive numbers here. So this is just some positive constant, okay? So what you'll typically see this thing written as is just to remind ourselves the fact that that thing is supposed to be a positive constant here is you'll see this as partial u with respect to t minus it's just some constant let's call it c squared here laplacian of u is equal to zero here so in this case we have this c squared is basically your Thermal conductivity over the specific heat times density. This is sometimes referred to as the thermal um, diffusivity. This is in units of meters squared per second. Okay. Here, U is our function of X, Y, Z, and time here. Right. So this is the temperature at X, Y, Z, 
at time t, right? K here was our thermal conductivity. This is in units of uh, joules per Kelvin second meter. Um, sigma here was our specific heat. This was in units of joules per kilogram Kelvin. Uh, rho was our density of the material. Units of kilograms per meter cubed. And finally, uh, Nobles squared U was our Laplacian of U, right? Which was just uh, our, our second partials added all up together here. So this here is our heat equation because we saw that it measures or describes how heat moves around a region um, if there is no heat being generated within that given region here, right? This is also sometimes referred to as the diffusion equation because it can be used to model how chemicals diffuse um, from a, something like within a gas here, right? As you can probably imagine that acts a lot like how temperature or heat distributes itself through some type of body here. So this is actually kind of interesting. So you end up with, uh, this, again, very interesting, elegant partial differential equation, which governs um, a, a very interesting physical engineering phenomena here. So with that, um, I think we've gone ahead and derived it. We see that this now is our linear second order homogeneous partial differential equation, very similar to a 1D wave equation. So what I'd like to think about next here is how can we go ahead and solve this uh, PDE for a variety of different conditions. So I think we're going to save that for another video though. So um, with that being said, I hope you enjoyed the video. If so, please subscribe to the channel because we will have other videos including how to solve this um, both analytically as well as discuss numerical solutions to partial differential equations in the future. Um, and I hope to catch you at a future video then. Bye!